Amen. All right, here, look at Hebrews chapter number 6, verse number 20 to get the context. Just as we've done each week, it has spilled over into the next chapter just to make sure that we have the context correct. Look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 20. The Bible reads, Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of of Melchizedek. So notice that Jesus there is mentioned. He's going in within the veil, referring to the within the veil within the temple. And then he is also spoken of as being a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So there we see Jesus being spoken of. We see him being talked about as being our priest. We also see him being spoken of as being eternal. That's one thing that we're going to see here in these first few verses heavily focused on is, is that the fact that Jesus is eternal. I want you to look with me here at Hebrews chapter number 7, verse number 1. His eternal existence. It's going to liken that unto Melchizedek here. It's going to use that point to prove that. Hebrews chapter number 7, verse number 1. It says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Now, we can learn a couple of things there in verse number two that are important about the character of Melchizedek. Number one, we're given the definition of what his, word, his name actually means. And it is a word, of course, as well. But the, the name Melchizedek, you're told there in verse number two, means by interpretation, king of righteousness. And then it says this, and after that also it says, king of Salem, which is king of peace. So he was also referred to as king of Salem. Now what is Salem? Salem is of course referring to Jerusalem. So he is the king of Jerusalem. He is also the high priest of Jerusalem. This is also where in the Hebrew language where they get the, uh, the saying shalom, right? Where they will say hello or goodbye by saying shalom. And that means peace. And it's a way to just say like how we say God bless you, right? Or Godspeed, people would say that, right? It just means peace be with you. It's just a blessing that's being you know, bestowed upon the, uh, the person that's leaving, right? So notice there that he's the king of Salem. He's the king of Jerusalem, right? He's the king of righteousness. He's also, of course, a high priest. So he's the high priest of Jerusalem as well. Here in verse number, uh, verses 1, 2, you know, and then you go down, like down, I guess he's mentioned all the way till verse about verse 11, Melchizedek is spoken of. He's mentioned in two other chapters before this, you know, uh, mentioned just briefly that verse is kind of quoted that is found in the book of Psalms. But besides that, the only other time that, that uh, Melchizedek is mentioned is in the book of Genesis. I want you to go back with me to Genesis chapter number 14, and we'll look at the character quickly of Melchizedek and who he is. There's a lot of discussion about who Melchizedek is. <clears throat> so we'll talk about that as well, who the person uh, Melchizedek actually is. So look at Genesis chapter number 14. We're going to begin in verse number 17. This is, of course, as was mentioned in Hebrews 7. This is when Abraham is returning back from the slaughter of the kings. It says in verse 17, The king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kedar Laomer. And of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheva, which is the king's dale. That's a vale or like a valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God. So I want you to notice again that this is reiterated actually in this passage that he's not only a priest. Oftentimes we think of him as his identity of being a priest. You know, he is a high priest. But he is also a king. He was also the king of Jerusalem, he's referred to as. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and when he was and when he was the priest of I'm sorry, and he, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the, the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. It's referring to uh, Abram or Abraham giving tithes unto Melchizedek, or unto Melchizedek. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth. And he goes on to say that he's not going to pay even a, a thread or a, of, of a shoe latchet unto 
him. I want you to go back to uh, Hebrews chapter number 7. Hebrews chapter number 7. We're going to read a little bit more about Melchizedek. We're giving some more information about who he is. I'm going to read to you from the passage in the book of Psalms where the only... So he's talked about in Genesis 14. You have to think of how interesting this character is. He's, this is the only time he's ever mentioned. Right here in Genesis 14. Then all of a sudden he's brought up again what seems randomly... In Psalm chapter number 110, now this is a messianic psalm. Even, even Orthodox Jews today would identify this psalm as being messianic. It's the psalm that starts out, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. That's verse number 1 in Psalm chapter number 110. You get to verse number 4 and it says this, The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou, referring to who? The Messiah, the Christ to come. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So I mentioned this actually, uh, I believe it was Hebrews chapter number 5 where it discusses uh, just br very briefly uh, Jesus as being Melchizedek. He's likened unto Melchizedek and how the Christ was prophesied here in uh, Psalm 110 verse 4 to be the, uh, you know, a high priest. He was also prophesied to be a high priest. Not only that, we can see the fact that he's mentioned as being eternal. So that's the mention of Melchizedek after Genesis 14. Then we get to Hebrews chapter number 7, and this is the next mention. This is the very next time, you know, in the book of Hebrews, briefly Hebrews 5, but now he's actually being discussed in Hebrews chapter number 7. Right there in verses number 1 and 2, it really just talks about you know, Melchizedek appearing unto Abram, how he paid tithes to him, gives you the interpretation of his uh, name. And then verse number three, we're really given some deep information about him. And this ties in with the prophecy of Psalm 110.4. And this is his eternality. Look what it says in verse number three. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days, nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now this is of course speaking about Melchizedek. And it's saying that you know he abides a priest continually. At this point it's very cryptic of who it is speaking about. But one of the things that I want you to notice here, and this is extremely important. Notice that it's likened unto, it says, made like unto the Son of God. Right? But... Also, I want you to look at the characteristics that, that are said about Melchizedek. It says this, Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. And of course, this is a major attack on the man-made doctrine of the you know, eternal sonship of Christ. Because this is actually referring to his sonship, isn't it? Because it says... The, the, the uh, comparison, that is. It says, made like unto the Son of God. So if you, if you uh, right now accept that it's speaking about Melchizedek in a cryptic way, and of course, I'm sure everyone knows here that, and I'm going to preach this in just a moment, that Melchizedek, as far as his true identity, is Jesus Christ. And it's, but right now, it's speaking in a very cryptic way, and it has, it's just introducing the character, and it's comparing him unto whom we know as the Son of God, Right? And then it, 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 and when comparing them, it's saying that they are similar in what way? Well, it's telling you that Melchizedek is without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days. Okay? And then it says that that's like the Son of God. Right? Now, if you compare these two statements to one another, right? And you look at the man-made doctrine of the, the, you know, if you will, it's, it's part and parcel with the Trinity itself. The Orthodox Trinity, that is. But the doctrine of the eternal sonship of Christ. What does the doctrine of eternal sonship of Christ teach? I mean, just in its name. That He is eternally the Son of God, right? And these people, they teach that He is the Son of God in three ways. He's the Son of God, you know, by His flesh, because He was fleshly born on this earth. He's the Son of God by His resurrection. But also... He's the Son of God. It's ridiculous. Eternally. In, on into eternity past. He always has been the Son of God. Right? So, if He was always the Son of God, what would that mean that he would, it would require? What would that necessitate for Him to have with Him at all times as well? A Father. Right? A Father. Well, right now it's telling you that Melchizedek is like the Son of God in what way? 
Neither one of them have what? A father. Neither one of them, it says, it says, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. So the way in which that Melchizedek is like the Son of God is what? He has no father. He has no mother. What does the Son of God not have? A father and mother. It, and then the question, of course, would come up, well, this sounds confusing. How is he the Son of God? This is where Jesus Christ's dual nature explains everything. And it always is what explains everything. Almost in every single case of the confusion, it's the mystery of godliness. That God became a man. And when he became a man, that happened through the conception of the Holy Spirit and he was born unto God the Father. That is when and how he is referred to as the Son of God. And of course, we get the definition of the Son of God from Luke chapter number 1. And I'm not going to go there right now because I've preached on this passage numerous times and I, there's, this is a long passage and a lot of details. So, Right here we can see that verse number 3, and I mentioned this in the beginning, you know, the intro of the book of Hebrews, that the sonship of Christ is talked about a lot. It's defined for us. We can get a lot of doctrine from the whole book of Hebrews on the sonship, on his deity. This right here is a great passage on, <coughs> excuse me, the deity of Christ. It's saying that Melchizedek is like the Son of God. How? The Son of God, it says, has no father, has no mother, without descent. It says, having neither beginning of days. You know what the Son of God has? He doesn't have beginning of days. He doesn't have a beginning. That's why the Bible says in John chapter number 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Son of God is the Word made flesh. So if we look at the two natures of Christ, if we look at these two different aspects of Christ, we can see that verse number 3 is clearly referring to the deity of the Son of God, isn't it? It's referring to His deity. It's speaking of Him as God. Right? We know that, of course, he is fully man as well, but this is speaking about his Godhead. Look at, it also tells you at the end of verse number 3, abideth the priest continually. So that's another similarity that Melchizedek would have with the Son of God. Now look at verse number 4. It says this, Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of his spoils. Verse number uh, 5. So notice there it says first, let me point this out. Notice it said he gave the tenth of his spoils, okay? Um, verse number 5. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law that is of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. Verse 6. But he whose descent is not counted from them, talking about not from the Levites, right? Received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. So, verse number 6 is where things start to be tied together, where his, the true uh, uh, um, you know, identity of Melchizedek begins to be uh, revealed. So, verse number 6 makes the statement, but he whose descent is not counted from them, saying from the Levites, received tithes of Abraham. Now, if a person just believed that Melchizedek was not an appearance of Christ and he was an actual you know, character that lived at that time, it wouldn't make any sense to mention the fact that he does not descend from the Levites. Of course he didn't because he would have been living as a concurrent or a contemporary with Abraham. So there would be no, men, there would be no purpose or reason to mention that. <clears throat> then it goes on to say this, verse 7, and without all contradiction, the less, the less is blessed of the better. So what's that explaining? So who blessed who in that scenario? It's saying that Melchizedek blessed Abraham. So he gave the blessing unto Abraham. So in that kind of situation, of course, if one person is blessing or bestowing a blessing upon another, who's the greater? Of course, the person that's able to give 
to the lesser, right? The one that's able to, to give the blessing. You know, uh, God, we would pray that God blesses us, right? Why is that? Because, of course, God is greater than us. God can give things to us. God can bestow things upon us, right? You know, all throughout the Bible we can see this pattern where, you know, Abraham is blessing Isaac. Of course, the father is greater than the son. Isaac is, is then, you know, blessing his son, Jacob. You know, it's saying that the less is always blessed of the greater. So, what, what's being taught is that Melchizedek, it's trying to prove to you how great Melchizedek was. This wasn't just some random man. You know, he was a great man. How great was he? Well, he was greater than Abraham. Another thing that's being mentioned here to prove that is the fact that Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Doesn't that kind of give priority or significance, importance, whatever you want to say, to Melchizedek over Abraham because he's going and paying the tithes to him in that sense? That's the point that's being made because he's paying tithes to him. As far as being a man of God, isn't there some sort of significance to Melchizedek above Abraham, that's the point that's being made. So in those two ways, it's, it's slowly starting to make this point that, that he is better or greater spiritually than Abraham. Now his true identity is very clearly revealed in verse number 8. Notice what it says next. <clears throat> and here, it's saying on earth, men that die receive tithes. And that's the Levites. But there, and that's referring to at the time when Melchizedek uh, received tithes from Abraham. But there he receiveth them, of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. Now, this verse right here, I believe, is the nail in the coffin. A lot of people will debate about who Melchizedek is. Was it, what is his true identity? Is he just a man? You know, you know I've heard people even say it's a, an Old Testament appearance uh, you know, in the Old Testament of the Holy Spirit. I've heard people, of course, you know, preach what I believe the text is clearly saying, that it was a, an Old Testament appearance of Christ. Um, and then I've heard people say that they think it's you know, just a man that lived at that time period. But right here it clearly tells you who the person was. Notice in verse number 8 it says this, But there he receiveth them. Now who is the he referring back to? That is an antecedent for what name or what word? Melchizedek. Who was it that it just spoke of that received tithes of Abraham? Obviously all throughout verse 1 through uh, 9 there, it's speaking about, or I'm sorry, verse 7, it's speaking about Melchizedek uh, receiving tithes from Abraham. So then it makes it restates and it says, but there he receiveth them. And then it says this, of whom, another antecedent, again referring back to Melchizedek, of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. Now, who in the, in the entire Bible, who is the one person that is witnessed on behalf of that lives? Who is it? It's Christ, right? He is the one that people go around witnessing. You know, Jesus talked about, him, about the disciples being a witness un, uh, unto him, right? In Acts chapter number 1. Of what? The fact that he had rose from the dead, that he lives. That's what we go around doing. We go around witnessing that Christ lives. We go around knocking on people's doors telling them that Christ has resurrected. That was what he had sent them, sent them forth to do was to go tell people that I have rose, that risen from the dead. That I live. That was their job. So we can see clearly that this is a reference to already the Lord Jesus Christ. That Melchizedek was actually an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 9. It says this. It further speaks in this way, in these terms. And as I may so say, Levi also, <clears throat> who receiveth tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. Now, it's interesting how he words that, and as I may so say, then he goes on and says, Levi also, who receiveth tithes, right? So, Levi was, all, obviously the tribe of Levi is the one that received tithes of all of the other tribes. They were the priests, right? They were the ones that received the tithes. But it's saying that they paid tithes through Abraham, because Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. And it tells you why it says that. Verse number 10. For he, talking about Levi, was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So by proxy, if you say, hey, well, Abraham is better than Isaac, and Isaac is better than Jacob, and Jacob is better than Levi, 
By proxy, this proves that Melchizedek is even so far as better than Levi. Why? Because Levi, in the sense, was in the, was in the loins of his father, Abraham, at that time. And what did Abraham do? He paid tithes till Melchizedek. So what is being proven right now? What's the point of this? Right now, it's introducing... Remember how the whole book of Hebrews is how Jesus is better than this. The New Testament is better than the Old Testament, right? You know, Jesus is better than uh, uh, man. Jesus is better than the angels. It just goes through all of these different things. He's better than Moses was one of the things that was mentioned. We're going to get into, and we already have a little bit, how the New Covenant is better than the Old Covenant. Right now, what's being introduced is Jesus and his priesthood is a greater priesthood than the Levites' priesthood. The Levites paid tithes to Jesus. Think about that. Doesn't that kind of give him, you know, superiority? Doesn't that kind of give him supremacy when you find out that, hey, the Levites who received tithes, well, they and their priesthood paid tithes to Jesus. It's introducing the idea and the concept that his priesthood is greater than the priesthood of the Levites. Also, the point that's, going, that's coming across right now is that it's two different types of priesthood. They don't have the same priesthood. I want you to look at the next verse there. Look at verse number uh, 11. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Now, Verse number 11 is a super important verse for a couple of reasons. It tells you ideologically what Paul is doing all throughout the book of Hebrews. He's writing to, a, to an audience that is a part of a group, the Jews, that have by and large throughout history rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, rejected you know, God, the Bible, he just rejected his disciples, all of it, right? And he's writing to them right now, and he's skeptical of them. You can see that all throughout the book of Hebrews. But furthermore, he's explaining to them because, you know, there are certain things that the, um, that the, the Jews were real big on. And their heritage was one of them. And the law was one of them, right? These were, these were certain things that the Jews were very big on. And <clears throat> remember how... When there were scuffles and there were disagreements and fights, like when Paul would come and preach, or while Jesus is preaching, when the, 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 you know, the, the God-haters, if you will, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, when they're trying to sway the common man away, what do they keep saying? He's preaching against Moses. He's pre preaching against the law. And they say the same thing about Paul, don't they? They say, you know, he's preaching against Moses. He's telling, you know, they don't, nobody has to be circumcised anymore. He's saying that we don't have to keep the law any longer. Don't they keep saying that? Right. So this is what's pushing away the Jews. So what Paul is doing throughout the book of Hebrews, not only is he trying to sure up those that are saved, but furthermore, he's trying to convince them and make sure that they understand, show them scripturally that, that this, the, that the Messiah that came, he is the Messiah of the Old Testament. And the things that are being fulfilled in the New Testament, uh, in the New Testament scriptures, he's connecting those dots for the Hebrew. They've been taught the Old Testament scriptures. And if they weren't saved previously, they were taught all types of, you know, uh, false doctrine. They were taught all types of bad, wrong things. So he's getting into the Old Testament scriptures throughout the book of Hebrews. And he's connecting the dots with Jesus and the Christ and all of the fulfillments in the New Testament and showing them that this is actually what was for to come. This is, this, this is the religion of the Old Testament. And I, I said all that because I want you to look at verse number 11 and notice what he actually says here. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Do you know what he just did? He just cited Psalm chapter number 110 to them. I'm sorry, 102. Do you know what he said? He's saying this. That if you just want to keep the, the Levitical law, if you think that the Levitical law is what's perfect and it can't be added to and that's what's going to continue, he's basically saying this. Answer me this. Why is it quoted in the, New Test, in the Old Testament in the book of Psalms that there is going to be a priest that rise after the order of Melchizedek? 
What would the purpose be? That's what he's saying. Because he's asking a question. He's saying, what's the purpose that another... Why was that, why was that prophecy made? That another priest would rise if the Levitical priesthood was good enough. If you're saying, hey, don't throw away the Levitical priesthood, and the Levitical priesthood is what's perfect and great, and we need to hold on to that, then explain this scripture to me. You know what you need to do today if you ever talk to a priest? If you ever talk to a priest? If you ever talk to a Jew? Show him Psalm chapter number 102. And explain it to him. And show him, you know, is there ever going to be another priesthood? You know what they'd all say? I guarantee they'd say no. Of course not. The Levites are going to be the priests. Then why does it say that there's going to be another priest that arises after the order of Melchizedek? Do you know what that shows you is that the Levitical priesthood is flawed. It, there's something missing or we wouldn't need another priest to come up. There's a problem with it. There's an issue. And you have to explain the passage. That's what Paul is doing. Explain to me why another priest is coming. And you at least have to say, hey, you at least admit there's another priest coming, right? Well, the Jews' religion can't, they can't explain it. So he's, what he's doing is he's ideologically using the Old Testament against them and showing, hey, there has to be another priest that's coming. This is a fulfillment. This is what you should expect. You should expect the Messiah to come and guess what? Be the high priest and proclaim to be the high priest and proclaim to be eternal after the order of Melchizedek. This is what you should expect. This is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. It just proves that it is, you know, uh, uh, that this is divine. That's what it proves. Because when you get into man's religion, man's just... You know, falls away from God and it's just tradition and things like that. You know what they do? They, overlook, they'll, they will overlook and misunderstand prophecies like this. But notice how fine-tuned and how exact this is. That when the, when the Messiah does show up, guess what? He's a high priest. He's the king of Salem. Look at what it says next. <clears throat> Verse number 12. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. So also, do you know what another problem that all the, the Jews had with? He said he's going to come and change, you know, uh, uh, you know Moses' commandments and the law. He's teaching us to not, you know, follow the law, nor Moses. So once he explains that, hey, the priesthood is going to be changed, right? There is going to be another priest that arises, right? And they're like, well, you know what? You are right. That does teach that. Then when the Messiah comes, he will be a priest. Then you, you understand, well, that priesthood was attached with the law. So if that priesthood is going to be done away with, do you know what else there's going to be a change of? Because that priesthood was attached to the law. There's going to be a change also of the law. You notice how he's just deconstructing, you know, what the Jews' arguments while he's writing it? That's the purpose of the letter to the Hebrews. He's firming them up that they are following the religion of the Old Testament. And he's explaining and, and, and connecting all of the dots for them. So because there's a change of that priesthood and there's a new priesthood that's established, and we have confirmed that with the Scriptures, the priesthood... Levitical, that is, was attached to the law. That's why we refer to it as the book of Leviticus, Levitical law, right? That also, you know, by nature has to be changed as well. So it says, There is made of necessity a change also of the law. Now watch verse 13, further proving Melchizedek was actually an Old Testament appearance of Jesus. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. Now that is a connection with verse number 6. But he whose descent is not counted from them, referring to the Levites, receives tithes of Abraham. So you know who's, who his descent was counted from? Well, if you look at verse number 14, it says this. It's explained. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. Now, verse number 6 is clearly still speaking about Melchizedek at that point. It's even much deeper in the context of Melchizedek. By the time we get to verse number 13, you know, it's still using he and it hasn't even used the name Jesus yet. I don't believe, has it? I don't even think it's used the name Jesus yet. So the... the antecedent that it's referring back to repeatedly is Melchizedek. It just used Melchizedek in verse number 11, the order of Melchizedek. So in verse number 13, of course that he there is Jesus. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe. That tribe is Judah, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. Because of course only the Levites were allowed to approach the altar in the Old Testament. Verse number 14, for it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, 
of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. So, you know, obviously the Jews would have a problem with this in the sense that only the Levites are allowed to be priests. So again, he explains that, hey, there's a prophecy of another priest that's going to arise, but there are two entirely different priesthoods. In the Old Testament, you know, of course, the Levites were the ones that, uh, you know, they were the ones that awaited the Old Testament covenant. And they waited upon and ministered unto the Old Testament covenant and the Old Testament law. They were the ones that were the teachers of the law. That was their job. That was intertwined with and embedded in the law itself. Now I want you to keep that in mind because look at verse number 15. And it is far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there ariseth, ariseth another priest. Verse 16. Who is made... Not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. So as I said, one of the points that he's trying to make is that this Levitical priesthood, this is attached to the Old Testament covenant. Right? But this other priesthood, it's the priesthood of Jesus, the high priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, it's not of. He's not just stepping in and, and replacing the, the Levitical priesthood. It's a totally different priesthood. And it's made after a totally different covenant. It's a part of a, whole, a totally different covenant. The covenant that the, that the Levites waited upon and ministered unto was a carnal commandment. It was a carnal commandment. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, it's called the ministration of death. It's the ministration of death. Then he speaks of in first, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 3. Then he speaks of in 2 Corinthians 3 the ministration of life. So there's two of them. One that is the ministration or the covenant of death. Then there's the covenant or the ministration of life. Just as we see here, who is made? Jesus, not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. Now, one thing that I used to misunderstand until recently, until I read over and studied Hebrews chapter 7 a lot, was specifically what the change is also of the law that it's speaking of right here. Now, when you see here in verse number 16, it tells you who is made not after the law of a carnal command, but, but after the power of an endless life. Look at verse number 17. For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, that's him being made you know, after the power of an endless life. For he testified. That was, that was, you know, the pronouncement or the proclamation that he was the priest and that came from the Lord's mouth, of course. Verse 18 says this, For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. Now, I used to under, misunderstand what the, the, the change of the law was, what the change was that took place. You know, I used to talk about that it was, I thought that it was the sacrifices specifically, which that's somewhat true, but that's not the only thing that's being discussed here. Because what's being talked about is, as I've mentioned, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And when you get to Hebrews chapter number 8, the whole chapter is about this. It's summarized in verse chapter number 13, or verse number 13 of chapter number 8. In that he saith, a new covenant he hath made, the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. The change that's being made is the doing away of the old covenant. The old covenant vanishing away, if you will, and then the new covenant replacing it. It talks about there's going to be a new covenant. And why was that? Because they weren't able to keep the old covenant. They failed, right? They messed up repeatedly. So he says, you know, uh, in, I think it's Hebrews chapter number 8, <clears throat> he talks about... Uh, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. So he talks about right there about how they failed. Right? And they weren't able to keep it. So he replaces that covenant with a new covenant. That is the change that's made. That's what's being discussed right here. How the priesthood was attached to the first commandment or the first testament. But now there's a new covenant that's coming in. And there's a priesthood attached to it. There's two totally different priesthoods. Two totally different commandments. One is after a carnal commandment. One is after a power of an endless life. 
they're being contrasted right now. It gets clearer and clearer because if you look at verse number 19, or verse number 18, it says, we'll, uh, we'll read it one more time, back in chapter 7 that is, For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. Now look at verse 19. Verse 19 for the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. Was anybody ever able to make it to heaven through the Old Covenant? Was there any profitableness of the, of the sacrifices in a spiritual sense of the lambs or anything? There wasn't. There was none. Right? That's why, you know, he always talks about how he's filled with them. He doesn't want them anymore. That's not what, you know, obviously the new covenant was established and, and, and you know, uh, confirmed later in history. But the promise was already given to him. It just wasn't confirmed until later uh, in, in the sense of the blood and everything. So right here, notice what that's referring to. That's talking about how the law made nothing perfect in the sense that the old covenant wasn't able to save anybody. But then it's contrasted with this, but the bringing in of a better hope did. What is that talking about? That's the new covenant. The bringing in of a better hope did. And it says, by the which we draw nigh unto God. By what do we draw nigh unto God? By Jesus. By the new covenant. By his priesthood. That's what this is talking about. It's talking about the new covenant replacing the old covenant. That's what this is speaking in terms of. Look at verse 20. And, as, and inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made priest. So he was made with an oath, that's saying. Verse 21. For those priests were made without an oath. But this, talking about Jesus, with an oath by him that said unto him, the Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So there is the oath that was made to Melchizedek, or Jesus that is. Notice that that promise there was given to Jesus, right? And it is an oath that he is going to be a priest forever. And it was made, it was confirmed with an oath. Verse 22, by so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. Notice here, covenant testament is being spoken of because that's attached with the priesthood. <clears throat> Jesus' priesthood was not just a priesthood coming into the old covenant. It's a totally different covenant. That's what's being discussed. Look at verse 23. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to, they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. Obviously, you know, they had to you know, you know, keep anointing a new high priest, didn't they? If you think about that, you know, a new high priest is being anointed. Can you imagine, like, if you, you know, a lost man whose faith is in some priest? And let's say you're 30, 40 years old, and this guy's like 70, 80, and that dude dies. I mean, put your mind, your carnal mind, into the position of, in the, in the, in the shoes of this person. Wouldn't that be scary? If, if your trust is in this man to help you, to get you to heaven, and that guy passes away... And, you know, of course, yeah, there's a new priest that steps in, but it's not the same. You know, you would be, it would, it would make you feel uneasy, wouldn't it? What if this guy's not doing a good job or whatever? You know, so, and, and obviously they never trusted in the priests of the Old Testament in that sense. That's definitely not what their job was. But it's talking about the weakness of that whole covenant, of that whole system, right? It's talking about the weakness and unprofitableness of the priests. It's talking about the weakness and unprofitableness here shortly. Uh, in this chapter, of the sacrifices. All of this is a part of what? The Old Covenant. That's what it's talking about. Verse 24, But this man, referring to Jesus, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. So because he's eternal, because he, it's a, that's why it talks about it, of him, it's witness that he lives, right? Because he's, he's eternal, he has an, he has an unchangeable priesthood priesthood. So there's not going to be a time when you need to pray to Jesus. When you go, you know, to pray to Jesus and nobody's on the other side. He's always going to be there. He's always going to be able to answer your pray prayers. He's always going to make intercession for you. You know, he, he will always be there, you know, uh, standing in the place of the mediator who atoned for our blood, for our sins with his own blood. Look at... Uh, Verse number 24 compared to verse number 3. And I want to make a point here because Jehovah's Witnesses, all these cults, Mormons, and things like that, what do, what do they believe as far as uh, you know, the, the identity of Jesus? What do they think he is? 
Yeah, exactly. Man, Michael the archangel, right? They just think he's just a, a man. Do they think he's God? No. And if they were to look at a verse like 24, they'd say, yeah, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. That he's eternal going forward, right? That he's eternal now. If we come to him, you know, we can pray to him. That's not what I was referring to. Because look at verse number 3. Without father, without mother, without descent. Now watch this. Having neither beginning of days nor end of life. That is a super strong verse for the deity of Christ. That is an extremely strong verse because you know what it has him in? It has him being he in, like in the book of Isaiah, who says that he inhabits eternity. He has no beginning or ending. No beginning of days nor end of life, it says. He abides a priest continually. And that's throughout all history, eternally. He will always be a priest. Past, future. Past, present, future. So, that's a good way to debunk that you know, argument that Jehovah's Witnesses will use. Yeah, he's a priest. You know, he has his priesthood going forward, right? You know, but that's not what it's referring to. It's saying he abides a priest forever. You know, past, present, and future. Verse number 25. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Right? So that's, that right there is a testament to our eternal security. The fact that he's going to live forever. He's always going to be making intercession for us. He's able to save them, it says, to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. <clears throat> I want you to look with me at verse number 26. Let's keep reading. For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. How in the world could you read that and not realize that it's speaking of the Lord? So it says, for such an high priest became us. Became us. Again, this is referring to him becoming the Son of God. The Word being made flesh. This is again another great verse that ties in with what we looked at in Hebrews chapter number 2 at the very end. Where it over and over again says that it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren. That there was a change. It was the Lord, but he was made flesh. Here it says it became, he became us. It says who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners... And then it says, and made higher than the heavens. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, when speaking of Jesus, says that he is the second man, talking about Jesus, says that he's the Lord from heaven. That's what this is talking about when it says, made higher than the heavens. There's no one higher than him. He is the Lord from heaven. He's the only person that's holy. He's the only person that's harmless, that's undefiled, that's separate from sinners. He, uh, you know... Obviously, it's, it's referring to the Lord. His eternality is being spoken of and His sinless nature. That's only the Lord that it could be referring to. Look at verse number 27. Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law, and I want you to watch this, for the law maketh men high priests, which have infirmity, but the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the Son, who is consecrated forevermore. Now, a couple of things. Number one, verse number 27 was again relating to what is at the end of verse 26, as I said, speaking about his sinless nature, right? The reason because, you know, the reason being that he was sinless and had no sins of his own. He didn't offer up daily, right, a sacrifice. He just one time offered up one sacrifice because he didn't need one for himself because he's perfect, right, in the sense that he is sinless. He just died one time for the sins of forever. For every sin that anyone has ever committed, he died one time for our sins. And he didn't need to first offer up that other sin. Again, proving that his priesthood is greater than the Levite's priesthood, right? But then at verse number 28... Again, it goes back to, when it's speaking about the priesthood, the law versus the oath. Right? The law versus the oath. Now, the oath is the new covenant. The oath is the new covenant, and we're going to see that more so when we get into to Hebrews chapter number 8. 
And the law, of course, is what it's being contrasted with. I mean, that's pretty, I believe, self-explanatory. The two covenants, the law, the oath. The oath is referring to the promise. Hebrews chapter number 6. Go back to Hebrews chapter number 6. <clears throat> Look at Hebrews chapter number 6. Look at um, verse number 13. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. What are we told that that is in Galatians chapter number 3? And Romans chapter 4. It says, you know, in Galatians 3 that he preached before the gospel unto Abraham, right? So, that is the gospel there, what we read, read about. Notice it says that he swore this, right? Um, if you look down at verse number 16, it says, For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. So notice here in Hebrews chapter number 6, that promise, that swearing is also likened unto being an oath. In verse number 28, we see the, the law and the oath being contrasted. And it says this, For the law maketh men high priests. <coughs> Talking about the Levites. So what is that implying that? Jesus is not. He's not a man, right? Because it said that he became us, right? For the law maketh men high priests, which have infirmity. But the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the Son, who is consecrated forevermore. So even though he's referred to as the Son there, that's the title that it's referring to that he has. But it speaks of him on, his nat on the nature of his deity, it's not speaking about his humanity. Just like verse number 3 calls him the Son of God, but when it calls him the Son of God, it says, without father, without mother. Now, did the Son of God in his humanity have a mother? He, he did, of course, right? But who is the person of the Son of God? It is the Word, right? It is the Lord, right? So, in this sense, does he have a mother? He doesn't, does he? So, that's interesting how in verse number 28, how... It contrasts man and son, and I believe that son there is still referring to, like it is in this whole chapter, it's speaking oftentimes about his deity throughout this chapter. Now I want you to go to Galatians chapter number 3, and I'll show you a, uh, whoops, a uh, cross-reference here with Galatians chapter number 3. Galatians chapter number 3, and this is again a, a, a big um, theme of a lot of Paul's letters where he's contrasting the law and grace. And he's over and over again emphasizing that grace is, is uh, you know, the grace is greater than the law, right? Well, look in Galatians chapter number 3, and of course that's what Galatians chapter number 3 is about. Look at verse number 17. It says, And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, <clears throat> cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. So in this passage it's saying that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, speaking about when God confirmed the covenant, that's what we just read about in Hebrews chapter number 6. He confirmed the covenant, the new covenant, the New Testament. He confirmed that with Abraham, didn't he? Remember he confirmed it by an oath in Hebrews chapter number 6. It says the law... That's the old covenant, which was 430 years after. It was given or confirmed, if you will, 430 years after the new covenant was confirmed, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. So it's saying that the old, when the old covenant came into to effect or came into play, it did not replace the new covenant. It did not disannul or it did not affect the new covenant which was the covenant that was given at that time to Abraham. And it wasn't, of course, referred to as the new covenant yet uh, because you know, Christ hadn't fulfilled all aspects of it. But the promise was given. So the law couldn't affect it. But you know what's interesting here in Hebrews chapter number 7, and don't turn back there yet, it tells you in verse number 18, for there is, a, there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going forward for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. So notice that when the new covenant went into effect, what did it do to the old covenant? It disannulled it, didn't it? And why? Because of the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. That's why it tells you in the next chapter, in Hebrews chapter number 8, that that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So the new co covenant replaces that old covenant, doesn't it? And the old covenant's gone. So, you know, that shows you the power of, of, and the supremacy of the new covenant that we have today in relation to the old covenant. 
The promise was given to Abraham. Then the law came into effect and it wasn't, it wasn't strong enough or it wasn't powerful enough to affect the promise that was given to Abraham. So both of them coexisted. Both of those you know, laws and commandments, if you will, or I'm sorry, covenants, coexisted with one another. But then once the new covenant officially was put into place and, and implemented, it caused a disannulling of the old covenant because, of, because it was made after a power of an endless life. Because it, was, it is the ministration of life as opposed to the ministration of death. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3, when you have a minute, you should read that tonight because it talks about this exact subject, how the new covenant is so much better or greater than the old covenant. And that's going to be a lot of discussion going forward in Hebrews chapter 7. But furthermore, I want you to keep reading there. So there it's talking about both covenants, how the other one is put into place. Look at verse number 18, still in Galatians 3. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. <clears throat> uh, now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Then it goes on and says this, Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. So I want you to notice a lot of similarities between chapter Hebrews 7 and Galatians 3. And even if you continue reading, you'll see the same. Notice how life comes through the new covenant. But death comes through the Old Covenant. How, you know, uh, the Old Covenant is not, it's not, it's not uh, you know, able to bring people unto Christ. It's not able to bring them, you know, unto the Lord. It's not able to do the job. The priesthood was not effective enough. Um, and then also, the other point that I wanted to make was in verse number 28, this is the last point, it says this, For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath... Now watch this, which was since the law maketh the Son who is consecrated forevermore. So did you notice that in Hebrews chapter number 7 verse 28? Do you notice what it said? It says the oath which was since the law. What does it mean since the law in that sense? In that meaning, two different ways of sense. It's saying before. That's what it means. It's saying before. What did Galatians 3 tell you? It said the law, <clears throat> which was 430 years after, it says cannot disannul that it should make the covenant of none effect. So it's teaching the exact same thing. That the covenant or the promise or the oath was the same oath that was given to Abraham. Then the law came into place after that or later, right? Then the new covenant was you know, confirmed with Christ's blood afterwards. That's what it's teaching there in verse number 28. So, <clears throat> and then it ends with, since it says, which was since the law, maketh the Son, and then it tells you who is consecrated forevermore. And consecrated just means, it's not a word that's even, it's not used in the Bible a ton either, not as often as like sanctified or anointed or any of those words, but that's basically what it means. It means to be sanctified. Consecrated means to be set apart, right? It's referring to the fact of him receiving the oath he was sanctified into this specific priesthood. So what was the chapter about? Well, <clears throat> it's, it speaks of, of the change of the priesthood. It, it first, in the very beginning, you know, introduces the character of Melchizedek, and it uses all of the, it shows you the superiority of Melchizedek to the Levites. Then it reveals that Melchizedek was actually Jesus. It talks about, you know, in what way that he is after the order of Melchizedek, that he is eternal, he will remain a priest forevermore, and that he has a totally distinct and independent priesthood that is connected with the new, the new covenant or with the oath, right? And uh, the priesthood of the Levites was connected with the law or the Levitical uh, uh, priesthood, right? And then it goes on to speak about how the new covenant basically has replaced the old covenant and how the new covenant is greater than the old covenant. And there was, it was necessary that there would be a change uh, because there was weakness and unprofitableness in the old covenant. So a lot of the changes that were made were because they were only temporary. We'll get into the purposes and reasons why. But it was because those things were meant to be temporary. That's why they were weak and unprofitable. Uh, and then there in the end, it just speaks about him being the priest and being sinless. And then that he is consecrated forevermore. Again, 
uh, referencing his in eternality. All right, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. Uh, we thank you for being our priest, which will le live forevermore. Well, uh, we ask you, dear God, that uh, you'd be with the church, you'd be with anyone that is sick or maybe has an injury, any kind of uh, infirmity at all, dear God. Uh, we ask you that you would uh, bless our church. Uh, you'd be with Darius, dear Lord God. We, you would be with uh, uh, all of our church members, dear Lord, in all areas of our life. Uh, spiritually mostly, dear God, uh, help us to grow, help us to reach out to the community, help us to get many people saved, dear Lord, and uh, to preach the gospel, to be a lighthouse here in Jacksonville. We thank you so much uh, for all the blessings that you've bestowed upon us, and we ask you that you would continue to bless us. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen.